tell me what percentage of the food sold in Germany is organic? In Germany, we have five, six percent. It's a big market. It's we are the biggest market in Europe. You are the biggest market in the world by far because you have so many people, a big country. Uh, so we we do well. We do well, and in terms of volume, because we are many people in Germany, we have this big market. But more interesting is the relationship, the share. Uh, and there again, uh, everybody looks now at uh, at Denmark and organic Denmark because they have reached on national level. 13% of the food sales are organic. The average spending of a Danish person is 345 euro a year just for organic. And I've been in organic in, 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 in conventional supermarkets, Super Puxen, it's a cooperative uh, supermarket chain, the biggest. I thought I'm in a health food store. It was organic all over the place, 70, 80%. They have discount supermarkets, which is a European thing. When you get the Aldi's and the Lidl's, I think, meanwhile, in your country as well, uh, maybe Trader Joe or so in that direction. They have more or less the whole uh, range is organic. So if we want to see where we can go and where the stars are to go for, we all look at the moment to Denmark. And uh, this is actually amazing to study. And I only can recommend, look even closer to it. Um, I may say already, Denmark gets the highest uh, recognition and award uh, in the organic sector, the One World Award. Uh, in three weeks, we will give them in a, a virtual ceremony the award, and they deserve it because there's so much to learn from them, and they show what's possible. And a key, a key for the change is public procurement. Yes. Public procurement is just, this is a bag as big as you can imagine. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic label that distinguishes organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on pasture. You just heard from Bernward Geyer, the former director of IFOM, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. Bernward had so much to share about how organic is on the rise outside of the U.S. It's used as a tool to fight climate change and close the wealth gap. And we've split his interview into two episodes because there's so much there. So let's listen in to the first half of my co-director's interview with Bernard Geyer. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. And I'm very pleased today to be talking with Bernard Geyer. And I have known Bernard through writing letters for some years now. This is the first time I've actually gotten to see his face as we speak. So welcome, Bernhard. Well, it's nice to be with you and to ever we'll later watch uh, our little talk we have, our Easter talk. It's still a holiday here in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm very happy. I have seen you more often on screen. I have followed your fantastic symposium every Sunday, as a matter of fact. Uh, I, I had a great time to, to learn and understand your situation deeper. And now I'm thrilled that I can share some thoughts with you and some opinions and visions. Yeah, I just, a couple weeks ago, I had Bob Quinn visit the farm and uh, I interviewed him. We had a wonderful visit. Uh, what an interesting guy. And I read his book leading up to and after I, you know, I just finished it yesterday. Uh, you know, what a, what a tremendous body of work he's done. And he's, he, well, he's a hero. He's one of my heroes in America. Yes. I mean, you have quite a few, Yeah. Uh, yeah. but we know us for ages and we have become very close friends. And I had this fantastic privilege, I would say, that he invited me to, I'm a filmmaker as well, so he invited me to make a film about his Kamut story. And we made a beautiful 40 minute film, which is probably something you can share with the movement and uh, it's, it's online, it's available. And trust, uh, I learned so much from him. He's so inspiring. Yeah, yeah. And he is, he is real organic, for sure. He is, he's the real deal. Soil man, a soil man, <laughs> soil and seed. <laughs> so, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is that America is uh, fairly uh, insulated from so much of the rest of the world. Uh, of course, 
the community I talk to is mostly farmers and eaters, some policymakers for sure, and the policymakers are a little more aware, but the farmers and the eaters know very little about what's happening in Europe, in Asia, in South America, and and so I know you've been very connected in the world organic movement. And I thought it would be nice to start to have conversations uh, a little more actively between the world organic movement and the real farming movement in America. So can you tell me? Uh, well, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, I have to say uh, when you describe that uh, y the, your movement, the people you know, they are not so much in the international arena and in the news. This was actually my experience when I came as a very young man in the 70s, being a, a conscientious objector, refusing to join the army, coming to the States. And I lived for one and a half years in Washington, D.C., doing a social work in the, in the ghetto on 14th and 10th Street, eight blocks from the White House. And I was amazed at this time how little international news I found in the Washington Post. And you had to go to page 12 to get any. Uh, so this was my one of my impressions uh, that uh, America is so big and uh, has so much own news and so much own things to think about and deal about, and also so powerful, if you say so, that this is something very general. But it definitely holds for the organic sector. I fully agree with you. Uh, I don't know uh, the audience. Uh, may not know that I've been for 18 years director of the worldwide organization I from Organics International, International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, to give the acronym in its meaning. And it was my experience as well. It was the toughest region to connect and to, to, to uh, not to work with, because you, you, you have great movement and there's fantastic people from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, Elliot Coleman was a predecessor of me before I was a general secretary, originally then director, he had for a short time the responsibility of the Federation and the head office was on his farm. <laughs> so there is connections and there is a, a lot of interaction, but very much on a personal level, on, on a bilateral level. But the movement as a whole um, is not so much uh, connected to, to the real organic world and anything I can do to help to change this a little bit. Here I am. So yes, uh, the um, uh, perspective, let's say the international perspective to organic movement uh, is actually a fascinating one and it's really worth to look across the fence, across yeah. the garden fence, across the farm fence, across the borders, because there's so much happening outside and that should be known in the US also to help your cause and your struggle, I mean, you know, I follow your struggle, not only with empathy and, and sympathy, I, I follow it fighting with you and supporting you as much as I can with my network and the little influence I may have in the movement still. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, it's interesting, and uh, we can learn a lot from you, but there's the other way around too. And so yeah. I can only encourage, yes, look, and I may say I'm very happy in these days because finally, I remember the efforts go back 25 and more years when I tried uh, at this time with Cathy Di Matteo and OTA to set up an IFOM regional North American group. It took us more than 20, 25 years, but now we have it and I must say it's running. They have a beautiful newsletter and they finally came together and this now will connect you much better. So there is a fantastic silver stripe on the horizon. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I've actually been connected with people in iPhone EU for years now. Yeah. And I am a member of iPhone North America, but as you say, it's a very fledgling organization just beginning. And uh, iPhone EU, very established, uh, you know, uh, it's very developed. So it's we. It's the strongest group in iPhone for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Amazing. And in, in, in America, we've gone, we've just been dealing with national things so strongly. One of the things that was interesting to me when I, I got involved because of the certification of hydroponics and I started talking to the people in the EU and I said, you know, one of them was Marion Blum, who's on our board of advisors. Everybody I talked to in the Europe said, who do I talk to about greenhouses? And in the EU, they all said, talk to Marion. So I talked to her and... 
you know, they were being told by some people that in the U.S. nobody cared about hydroponic being called organic. It was fine. And I said, that's what we're being told about Europe. <laughs> no, it's... It I mean, let's get right straight to it. Uh, first of all, you have a beautiful connection uh, because I realized that you're connected with Naturland. This is an amazing pharma-based organization. Farmers have the say, pharma-controlled, and it's fantastic. Not an experiment, it's a reality since decades. Actually, I, in my role as IFAM director, I could help to make Naturland from a Bavarian, one can say at this time, a Bavarian farm organization, to probably the world player because we could connect them with the fair trade movement. The fair trade movement was in desperate need uh, and ready to go organic, which they were not at all at this time. Uh, we talk in the early 80s. And I went around and oh, everybody was just fine and we stayed German and but Naturland was open and that changed the organization completely. So they are an ideal partner for you. I know you had a beautiful contribution from Naturland in your symposium. So yes, there is there is uh, this, this uh, uh, many other groups like Naturland and uh, they they are ready to support your your cause. When it comes to hydroponics, as you touched on the question already, uh, IFOM is very clear positioned. Hydroponics have no place in organic and there is no higher authority than the IFOM World Organization. Uh, if they say no, it should be no. It should be no everywhere in the world. And there can be no exemption to that ruling, which is so fundamental to the principles of organic. To the ecological principle of organic, that there should not be even a moment of time wasted to argue. And so, and, and there have been messages, I know there have been contributions, there have been interferences in your struggle to the NOSB board, and uh, we have been in ongoing communication. The same holds, by the way, and I'm sure we talk more about it, uh, because animals are dearer to my heart than plants. Uh, we live here on an organic horse farm, Icelandic horse farm, certified organic writing lessons if you want. Uh, uh, the, the same is with the CAFO issue. Unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable, unimaginable and highly dangerous if it picked up by media. So far not yet, but if some smart journalist goes into this, it would harm the organic movement with world impact. That this yes. is possible uh, to be certified under the organic banner and logos. So let me ask you about that. I mean, I, uh, yes, I would like to talk about the, the strange strategy of the industrial organic in America, which is that we hope nobody notices, right? We hope that nobody writes a story about what's happening because it will be bad for organic. But um, the, of course the truth will come out. And I'm curious, what, what happens to the rest of the world organic movement if the USDA organic starts to collapse because our standards that are being, I don't mean traditional organic standards in America, but I mean the, the standards that the National Organic Program, the USDA is in fact enforcing are not world standards. They're very different. And mm -hmm. what happens to organic in Europe and Asia as a brand, as something that people rally around if the U.S. stumbles so badly? Will it impact the rest of the world? Well, let me first share with you, I don't want to even think about and I don't want to see that USDA stumbles and falls apart. If they don't listen, they deserve so. But I don't like this, even the idea of it because it would be a drama and a catastrophe also for the U.S. because I've been engaged from the very beginning in setting up the EU regulation in the 90s, in the late 80s. We shaped it to 91 when the regulation came out. And it made a big difference that organic could grow. And that I mean worldwide, that we had a regulated market, a protected market. It's clearly defined. Every imaginable word that gives an impression of organic is in the law. So it, there can be no misuse. And they did the right thing. They based their regulation on the iPhone basic standards which is the ownership of the movement. And it's shaped by the movement and by the experts and very much by pharma experience and by science. So um, that was the right thing. I know the struggle and the never ending story till we even came out with the law, how many years it took and, and, and crazy things that were in earlier drafts. Uh, so a lot has been prevented by the way, but not these two core essential things. And But if that happens, uh, the rest of the world will never, ever follow the USDA. 
There is no way that USDA could have its way uh, to say, okay, you follow us and you allow CAFO like you do it with chicken or this incredible big dairy herds you have, which no way ever can have access to outside, which is fundamental again in, our, in all the regulations and all the standards in the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, we, we would never follow you. So you would be isolated. You would completely lose your markets. As a matter of fact, if there's not soon a solution, uh, I think it is an issue for the EU as there's the equivalency ag agreement, which was signed at Biofach. I was present when your deputy minister, uh, Kathleen Merrigan, signed the equivalency agreement. It's not equivalent. It's fundamentally not equivalent, on the, at least on these two hot spots, which under normal uh, circumstances already would have been a reason to cancel off the equivalency or uh, for the USDA to change, to play according to the international worldwide rules. And the EU is the measure stick. When it comes to regulation, I think everybody has understood in the world, if you are not in line, at least there can be uh, changes, there can be differences. That's okay, we are diverse movement, but not on the fundamentals. And the two hot points we discuss, these are fundamentals. That's right. So, so we uh, have to do everything and we have to support you that it will not collapse. It has just yes. to do the right job, has to understand what is at stake. And I think what will make them hopefully listen, now you have a change of government, I hope the new administration will, will act a bit different. I think the market will make the difference because there is also export market uh, interests in your country significantly. Uh, they, if, if they see and feel they will not be accepted outside of the US anymore, as organic, uh, then I think uh, that is at least the motivation to make them think not only twice but change. Well, I fingers certainly, crossed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I fingers crossed. I hope so. You know, it's interesting because the the CAFO producers have tremendous amount of money there. The lobby same power. with hydroponic. Same with hydroponic. We're talking about billions of dollars and basically concentrated in very few hands. I mean, these are big corporations that, that run the big hydro, that run the big CAFOs, and they have tremendous influence. So, you know, we are in a fight. Uh, I, 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 I often quote Bill McKibben, who said when he, he, began, when he began dealing in, in the climate movement, he said, at first I thought we were having a debate. No. And then I realized we had won the debate years ago. We were in a fight, and it yeah. was a fight with money and power. And that's exactly the truth here. At first, I thought, are we having a debate about what organic means? I realized, no, we're, we're, we're no, in a fight. No, it's not debatable. On that point, it's not debatable. There is com common sense, there is uh, consensus, there is worldwide agreement, so there is no room for debate. So the only way is money comes in, gets its way, and then we have to pick it up, the challenge. And, and yes, I'm a pacifist, a hardcore pacifist. So luckily we don't fight with weapons. We don't fight with our pitchfork or our, our hose. But we fight it intellectually. We fight it intellectually and knowing that we defend the right, uh, the right organic, the real organic. The real organic, yeah. So good. Um, well, it's, it's a... A fight that's ongoing. I'm curious, the third thing, we fight three things in America with the USDA. And one is hydroponics being certified, and one is CAFOs being certified, and the third is grain fraud. And uh, a lot from Eastern Europe, from Turkey, and uh, it comes in. And I think that you don't allow that grain into the EU as organic. I think that that's been shut down pretty well by the EU. Am I right? Well, we, we, we work hard to prevent fraud. Fraud happens everywhere in the world. It's human stealing and we know humans uh, can do things very wrong and even get into criminal activities because that's criminal. But the EU law is so strong and strict that we have very strict measurements. I mean, we have been people going to jail for years for fraud in the early, and that sent signals. So the fraud is not so much happening in Europe but the import issue, like Ukraine has been a hotspot for fraud. 
a lot. Romania has been a hotspot, not so much Turkey on the radar at least. I don't know the volumes of fraud cases, but we, the, the certifiers are organized here. They work closely with the authorities and uh, the enforcement uh, uh, people. So uh, we have dealt pretty well. China is also hot. There is always fraud issues coming up from China and we get a lot of import from China. So uh, I would not pick uh, any country because, uh, yeah. I mean, even here, there's still fraud happening here and in small scales, I would say, not worth a scandal. But the dimensions and the money involved uh, in, in some of the big issues, this is, and it, what is it? It's feedstuff. So it kind of, it closes the chain. It's, it's more or less, I would dare to say, it's mostly the most fraud I see in the grain sector is for feedstuff grain. And I think Feed, quite a lot of goes to goes to goes to the CAFO. So this yes. is connected. There is there is an independency uh, to, to to produce cheap, cheap, and cheat uh, goes hand in hand. <laughs> yes. So uh, one of the things that is said in the U.S. Um, is that uh, basically in order to grow organic we need to embrace multinational players and those multinational players tend to bend the rules. And uh, I, I don't care to grow organic that quickly if that's the price, but I'm just curious with, with in the EU where things are stricter, where the standards actually reflect, reflect traditional organic, is organic still growing in the marketplace at a, at a steady rate? Rapidly, rapidly. Two digits grow since years. And it makes it interesting, makes it attractive for business, makes it attractive for big business. I mean, like in your case, the, I know that probably by now all 10 global big players, the Nestle's, Unilever's, uh, uh, Mondelez, formerly Kraft, they're all engaged in organic, which is okay for me. This is actually, I, I'm not against it. Uh, they are real. I fight them on other grounds and causes and try uh, to boycott like Amazon or so, which I, I never will order anything at Amazon. But this is our, it's, it's, a, not a se it's connected, but it's separate. If they do organic, they have to do it right. Here, my observation is they do it right. Like I'm engaged and very close to the big, second biggest retailer in Germany. That's a company that turns 75, 70 billion a year. They had been for a long time the biggest organic seller in Germany and they do it right. For example, part of their strategy is whenever we have access and can get, we don't buy only EU organic, which is okay. For me, it's organic because the, the, the law is, is not having loopholes like you. We buy from pharma organizations with their label and their biggest partner, they have a 10 year, very successful, very fair, I must say, partnership with Naturland, which you uh, you are connected with. And that works very well and it shows it's possible. So it's not the matter, small company, big company, uh, on other issues, we, we may have points, but when it comes to organic, as long as they really play to the rules, don't, uh, and here they don't use big lobby power. We have not at all comparable to the US situation, lobby efforts, uh, so to say, against us for own vested purely financial interests. I don't see that. They, they may have uh, wished to have things a little bit easier or so. They want certainly less bureaucracy. The whole the red tape we have created around certification, it's a nightmare. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's a very different situation. And because of this, uh, we have the energy and the room free to grow and prosper. And our, uh, we, I must say, we benefit from the corona. The sales are at highest levels, 20% uh, growth, 30% uh, growth. We get political support. You have reported, you're well connected. I think you interviewed already Paul, my, my dear friend from Denmark, Paul Holmbeck. Denmark shows what's yes. possible. That is po yes. that's all sound. This is real. This is real organic. And I've been on big farms. Uh, if you allow me, I make a little intervention of the experience of my recent visit. I was at a pig farm. 1,300 sows, one farm, 1,300 sows, raising all the piglets, 30,000 piglets. And I must say, and I have seen in 100 countries, organic farms, it's the best pig farm I have ever seen. Big as it is, commercially successful, 
but they have taken the pigs back to the forest. They plant forests for the pigs. They have all year outside, free range. And uh, I just, I didn't want to leave the farm. And I've been, I've been on an organic dairy farm with 500 cows. Super. I have run a dairy farm with partners here, so I know about dairy farming. They have free range, they have access, they go all summer to the pasture. But maybe that's the limit. Because by pure distance and by arranging and managing your grazing pattern, with a few thousand cows, I don't think, I, I cannot see how it works. But it can work with 500 cows. The calves are on straw, healthy cows, productive, not highest level productive, productive and economically viable. So it's not the size that matters so much, it's what you do. I always, in this context, I'm often asked in, in when I lecture or so, I'm often asked uh, about the size question. Huh? When, when is organic too big and does size matter? Of course, down the road it matters for social reasons, uh, land ownership reasons, whatsoever. But from an organic farming point of view, as a methodology, organic farming, it only matters is the right thing done. And then I usually ask the people, what is the biggest certified organic farm? And then I get numbers, oh, maybe 10,000 acres, 20,000 acres. If somebody is really into it, he may go high for the start and says 100,000 acres. The biggest farm is 1 million hectare. This is 2.5 million acre, one farm certified. It's in Australia, in the outbacks. But it takes 100 hectares or 250 acres to raise a sheep, to feed a sheep. So it's all relative. It's all relative. So let's get away from this uh, being fixed on the figures, on, on, on hectares and size. Uh, farm animals, we come to a point where we would have to discuss numbers, but that's not up forefront the points. Do they do the right thing? Do they improve the soil? Do they keep the animals well? Do they look for the quality of what they produce? And, uh, and if that is in place, then it deserves to be called and certified organic. Yeah. One of my very favorite uh, organic farms certified with us is 45,000 acres. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And it's only 450 head of cattle. But they herd yeah. them all over this dry land yeah. very carefully. Yeah. They do an excellent job. Um, oh, you have, you have uh, featured all, them. You have portrayed them. Yes. Yeah, all I, the spring I, I, ranch. I, love yeah, it. I shared it with my network around the world. I said, look, that's the way to go. <laughs> That's Super. Right. Yeah, no, it's possible. It's, that's, that's exactly yeah. proving it's not so much the, the size, uh, what, what's happening on the ground. And improving all the time that farm. That's Permanent one of the things that's interesting. And, and regeneration. Regeneration yeah. has become a very important element. We have to heal the land and yeah. uh, not have it stolen by the corporates to put their plastic containers. Yeah, yeah. So. <sighs> Let's, well, before we leave Europe, tell me what percentage of the food sold in Germany is organic? In Germany, we have five, six percent. It's a big market. It's we are the biggest market in Europe. You are the biggest market in the world by far because you have so many people, a big country. Uh, so we, we do well, we do well, and in terms of volume, because we are many people in Germany, we have this big market. But more interesting is the relationship, the share. Uh, and there, again, uh, everybody looks now at, uh, at Denmark and organic Denmark, because they have reached on national level, 13% of the food sales are organic. The average spending of a Danish person is 345 euro a year just for organic and I've been in organic in, 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 in conventional supermarkets super books and it's a cooperative uh, supermarket chain the biggest I thought I'm in a health food store it was organic all over the place 70 80 percent they have discount supermarkets which is a European thing mind you get the Aldi's and the Lidl's I think meanwhile in your country as well uh, maybe Trader Joe or so in that direction they have more or less the whole uh, range is organic. So if we want to see where we can go and where the stars are to go for, we all look at the moment to Denmark. And yes. uh, this is actually amazing to study and I only can recommend look even closer to it. Um, I may say already Denmark gets the highest uh, recognition and award 
uh, in the organic sector, the One World Award, uh, in three weeks we will give them in a, a virtual ceremony the award and they deserve it because there's so much to learn from them and they show what's possible. And a key, a key for the change is public procurement. Yes. Public procurement is just, this is a bag as big as you can imagine. I explain that to people. Yeah, public procurement means uh, there is enormous spending by governments, by uh, public uh, authorities, by institutions, on anything. It could uh, very much also on food and meals. We call them public meals. And uh, there are programs and, and uh, projects. Uh, we started very much in kindergartens that some of the food is organic. But the goal has to be not some of the food is organic, all the ingredients in public procurements, and namely in hospitals, ought to be organic. I mean, in hospitals, the day costs $750. They spend on food of the $750, $6. So you can get only crap and junk. Yeah. You can get, so, but you can do it different. And I have been in, 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 in my fact-finding mission for the One World Award in Denmark in, in a hospital, 100% organic ingredients. Uh, in Copenhagen, uh, they cook every day around 90,000 public meals. And the food for that is publicly procured, is bought, and they have the measures in place. They have the, uh, also the, the fund, the money in place. It's almost all, it's 90% organic. 80,000 meals a day, all organic. Imagine how many farmers can sell their products. Very close from nearby farms around Copenhagen. And uh, they have the best food. The chef was an inspiration, the chef of this hospital. He said, we had to make one big change in the beginning. I had to change people's mind. We had to get away from just heating up things, which we got in plastic, ready-made, to cook again. We have to cook again. And they took it consequent. They have their own bakery in the hospital. They have two bakers. They have their own butcher in the hospital making the sausages. And the most interesting part of that, at the end, when they calculate the cost for the food, it costs the same than conventional. How is that possible? Farmers get a better price. price. They pay the organic premiums. How is it possible? Two main reasons. One, food waste. They waste 25% less food. I mean, this is ingredients you bought and paid for and you throw it away. If you're lucky, you may give it to the pigs. But this is waste. And if and because people like it, the new food, the organic food is good, is tasty. They finish up the plates. I was in a kindergarten. There was not a rice corn on the plate left. The kids ate all. And uh, so you can save already 25% of your investment for food ingredients when you make public meals, you can save by, by saving food waste, reducing food waste by 25%. The other one is they reduce a bit the meat consumption. Now the Danish are meat lovers, especially pork meat. You cannot take the meat away. That would start a revolution in the other way. But they of course know it's not so healthy and they, they go along and they support in the restaurants. They tick their weekly meal being vegan or vegetarian. And with reducing the meat part, which is the most expensive part in, in public procurement for food ingredients, the overall calculation of the meal is coming to the same uh, uh, price than for conventional. So there's no argument, no reason not to do it. So, you know, Bernard, I, I grow tomatoes in a greenhouse and I had extra tomatoes one year. So I went to Dartmouth College, a very, very yeah. beautiful college, 10 miles from my farm. And, and I went to the buyers and I said, I would like to sell you tomatoes very cheaply. They will be not perfect, but they will be delicious and I will sell them to you at a low price. And they said, you have our permission and they're organic, beautiful tomatoes. And I went to the chefs and they said, we can't do it. We don't, we don't prepare food anymore. We cut open plastic bags, it's already chopped up and we dump it into trays. Maybe and they open said, if can, you huh? could, we have to can them for them. Dice them and can them. <laughs> yeah, if you would chop it up and seal it in a plastic bag, they may have not then even we would buy it. Yeah. It's, and it's so this is, this is, it's a whole system. It's not just, it's not just one thing, oh, let me give you a different fresh tomato. It's like they haven't seen a fresh tomato in a long time and they have no, no place to chop it up if yeah. they did. 
It's so, nice. you know, it's a, it's a system. It's a systemic thing. I, I do remember, I think that Paul Holmbeck told me that there's tremendous government support for organic in Denmark. And yes. we were trying to calculate what that meant in American dollars. And I, I came up with $19 billion dollars if it, that would be the annual support. And he said, yes, it's $10 a taxpayer. Yeah, it's yeah. not much money I, on the taxpayer side. It's not that much money. It's a lot of money and not that and much not money when you think of the changes that you could bring about with that. Yep, absolutely. So, it's, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, I want to go to Asia, but before we do, there's one thing I, I want to challenge you on. You know that article from uh, Nature that came out that, that showed that organic is uh, worse for the climate than conventional? Yeah. yeah. Did, did you ever yeah. see that article? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, it was well publicized in, in, in mainstream media as well. It was. They loved it. <laughs> Of course, of course, and it's not new actually. That that is out for a long time. This argument long and it's time. very much pushed by the chemical industry uh, as in things. And the, the 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 baseline is we need much more land because we are much less productive. And uh, no, I'm not buying that for many reasons. There are many counter arguments. First of all, you have to look closely. In I know many comparison studies, yield studies, where organic equals. If you look in the global south, I know shelves of studies and uh, scientific data and, and, and evidence that where traditional farming is practiced, which is not mistaken, should not be mistaken as organic, just not using chemicals is not organic. The moment they go and make compost and uh, crop rotations and cover crops and all the elements we have in organic, mulching, etc., they increase the yields a lot. So going organic in the global south very often means higher yields and that's where the hunger is. So uh, if, if we would transform with, again, not so much money for each farmer uh, to give the farmers training capacity building that they could learn and uh, implement and practice organic methods, the food production would significantly go up and uh, uh, in, in a very diverse setting of small farmers which is the right thing. And this is where the hunger is. We, we may use this question and these this aspects also to discuss the world hunger issue because that is the next in line in, the, in, in arguing against us. Oh, we, we need so much land. It will not, behind this is it, organic cannot feed the world. So I would love to touch on this in, in a moment. But just to this uh, study, uh, also we uh, have, I come back to the food waste issue. Not only what I told in the restaurant, in, in, in the hospitals, that food is returned and wasted. This is worldwide. We waste about 25% of the food produced, which makes it to the market one way or is in the market system. Uh, I'm not talking about the, the waste on field, where you always have some losses and waste. It's lost. If we would only half this, by half, the food waste would be probably the difference at the moment we have in the yields, let's say on global scale, in comparison to conventional. And so, and we have to come, I'm not a vegetarian, I had, uh, from the dairy farm, we moved to a beef cattle farm, uh, uh, but I'm no, and I argue uh, uh, that we have to not only think about our meat consumption, we have to change it. We have to change it to much less meat, better meat, not kaffir meat, not so-called kaffir organic, uh, and um, that would reduce because 80% uh, of the uh, grains and, and the, let's say the big crops like, like maize is fodder for animals. So we would have plenty of land to grow vegetables and grains for us and food for us if we would use much less land for feeding animals and then this in feedlots uh, where you have 50,000, 100,000 cattle and you, you grass fed them. This is crazy, ruminants. So if, if you take all, all this and more, I don't go to all arguments, but these are the three, four main arguments, you can dismantle the, 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 the kind of the indication behind all this that uh, if we would go organic, the world would starve. 
and that okay if, if you allow me then I, I bring it at this point it's I would say broadly accepted especially in the FAO I've worked for decades on the FAO and they have changed their mind quite a bit nowadays it's broadly accepted I hardly don't find a person anymore that would not agree uh, hunger is a child of poverty people have no access to food they cannot afford food they are detached from the land maybe they are driven off the land maybe by big landowners or big corporate interests i don't know but they have just no access to food and that's why they are hungry they are not hungry because we have not enough calories we know that already today we produce enough calories for 12 billion people now i'm not saying that our mother earth can hold 12 billion billion people but the food would be there but not on the steak and the bratwurst level or the schnitzel level we have here or on the steak level you have uh, on the hamburger level that's not possible but with some um, uh, more careful and more considerable consumption and changing consumption patterns a bit and not wasting food uh, everybody would not go hungry to bed or even die and it's a drama for me it's a crime for me it's a crime that since well as long as i'm an activist that we have not managed to uh, make sure that nobody dies because of hunger yeah yeah uh, you know that argument came up because i was talking to a group of professors at dartmouth mm -hmm. uh, we were getting ready to do a symposium and the chair of one department said, well, of course, organic is worse for the environment than conventional. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I realized he was quoting the Nature article. And I thought, well, OK, we need to uh, put together. I know that, that they have in Denmark, but put together a very cogent response to that to this share. Is, because here's, here's a very educated person who's in charge of educating some of the leaders of the world tomorrow. And this is the story that he's telling. He had the thought, wrong oh, education. Good. He listened to the wrong people, to the wrong lobby interests, to the long, wrong propaganda. Yes, we have fantastic publications and maybe uh, you can help and identify and help to bring them a bit more to the States, uh, which dismantle all this myth around organic, that we cannot feed the world, that we need more land. And, and there's a lot of this uh, spread. And uh, there's, uh, uh, is, uh, there is, uh, has been in, uh, I think it was in, 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 in science, a very good publication from the Fibble Institute. It's the biggest organic research institute, over 200 scientists in Switzerland with peoples in various countries around the world, India, Europe. Uh, they have done a very serious publication. It has been the first organic scientific publication where they show, yes, we can uh, provide enough feed, food for the world under certain conditions and certain paradigm shifts which i just mentioned one big one yes. is the high level of meat consumption and 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 the food waste thank you thank you for listening to the real organic podcast we hope that you will subscribe tell your friends and leave us a rating and review a video version of this interview as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 65 Please join us next time when we'll be speaking with Bernward Geyer again about some ways that organic agriculture is exploding in Asia. To support this podcast and our certified farmers, become a recurring donor at realorganicproject.org. See you next time.